Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 15th Annual Harker Research Symposium. My name is Anita Chetty. I'm the Upper School Science Department Chair. I'm also the coordinator of the research symposium for the past 15 years. Back in 2006, in what is now the Saratoga Auxiliary Gym, the Upper School held the first Harker Research Symposium with the theme being building a community of researchers. There were 21 student presenters, there are 44 parents, myself and the research teacher. But in that small gathering was our first Intel national finalist, Senior Yi Sun. Little did we know that Yi Sun was a trailblazer in more than one way, because at our first symposium, he gave his talk over Skype as he was on the East Coast at college orientation days. Now we know that Yi Sun was actually ahead of his time. I am proud to say that Dr. Yi Sun will be delivering the alumni keynote address this morning, once again, virtually. Last March, the Prepped and Ready 15th Annual Symposium was forced to go on hiatus. This year, once again, the COVID-19 pandemic threatened to cancel our symposium, which historically has been an interactive and intimate gathering of professionals and students. However, the symposium was created in the spirit of building a community of researchers, and my goal was to demonstrate that that community can be built and maintained online just as effectively. As you attend this year's presentations, I hope you note that these young students pivoted the way they had been learning and preparing for their respective topics to make everything online accessible and digestible. Science in particular is a study that requires physical interaction and collaboration. These students accomplished their research goals despite these unprecedented and uncharted hurdles. As many of us have had to make the same adjustment this year, I think we can all appreciate the difficulties and celebrate the accomplishments of bringing this symposium to life virtually. No one knows what it takes to create this amazing event better than the women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or WISTEM past presidents, who I am honored to say are all in attendance this year for the alumni panel. These accomplished young women represent 13 years of outstanding contributions, the research program, and the growth of the symposium into the event that you are attending today. These women led the way for the current WISTEM members who you will meet throughout this year's event and who I would like to thank for all of their hard work in organizing this symposium with me. I would like to also thank the dedicated professionals of the Office of Communications, Learning Innovation Design and IT teams. Without their hard work, a virtual symposium would not be logistically possible. I extend my gratitude to my colleagues in the science and computer science departments who helped the students not only navigate their research, but assisted them in bringing their work to life in this virtual environment. I extend a heartfelt thanks to the parents of the outreach committee who worked throughout the year to bring corporate exhibitors to our symposium, thereby elevating its status from science fair to scientific conference. Finally, our students are capable of doing this extraordinary work because of the support they receive at home. Thank you parents of all of our researchers for creating an environment where creativity is cultivated and inquiry is encouraged. When I say that it takes a village of committed individuals to make our research program possible, I truly mean it. And this year is a testament to that. After 15 years, our community of researchers thrives and builds ever stronger. I hope you enjoy this Hallmark 15th Symposium and thank you for your attendance. I now turn it over to WISDOM co-president, Pramiti Sankar, who is a senior, to moderate this session. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Chetty. So hi everyone, good morning, and welcome to our second day of our annual 15th Harker Research Symposium. Like Ms. Chetty said before, we'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I'm Pramiti Sankar, a senior and co-president of WISTEM, and I'm so excited to be moderating Dr. Chan's keynote today. Last night, we heard about how AI and automation impact the wellness industry from Dr. Wayne Liu. 
This morning, we're starting the day with a talk on how robotics is revolutionizing medical science and surgery. Before we start, I'd like to draw a few things to your attention. First, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A button on the top of your screen, or on the bottom of your screen, rather. You may do so any time during the talk. Please keep in mind that everyone in this webinar can see your questions. If you want to ensure that a question is answered, please use the Q&A to upvote that question. Time permitting, we will be inviting a couple of people to ask their questions live. We will open up the Q&A session once Dr. Chung has completed his talk. That being said, let me tell you a little about Dr. Chung. Benman Chung, MD, is an associate professor of urology at the Stanford University of Medicine and a urologic oncologist specializing in the treatment of prostate and kidney cancer. As director of robotic surgery at Stanford, he has one of the largest surgical experiences in robotic prostatectomy and robotic kidney surgery in California and has been elected both to Castle Connolly Top Doctors and Best Doctors in San Francisco. He is a graduate of Amherst College and Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University and completed his residency training at Massachusetts General Hospital and Leahy Clinic and continued on in his fellowship training in minimally invasive urologic surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. He also has master's degree in epidemiology from Stanford. Dr. Chung's research has garnered international recognition and focuses upon robotic surgical adoption and big data outcomes projects designed to improve outcomes of surgical management of urologic cancers. With his epidemiology background, he has also striven to better understand the causative factors in the formation of these malignancies to allow for future preventative action. Welcome Mr. Chung, or Dr. Chung. Thank you, Pramiti, <clears throat> and thank you, Dr. Uh, Ms. Chetty, and thank you to all the attendees, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, wonderful symposium. I'm glad it has been restarted in this virtual forum, and I'm re really honored and uh, delighted to participate. Um, let me um, share my screen so we can start um, the talk. So, <clears throat> For me, you know, robotic surgery is really something I do every single day. Um, but, you know, for the attendance of this uh, course, it's really something that, you know, I think you'd be more interested to hear about both past, present, and future. Um, the past really starts at this rather nondescript building known as the Stanford Research Institute um, in Menlo Park. And, you know, you'll see that a lot or almost all of the robotics uh, technology um, that we're going to be talking about today was actually developed right here in the Bay Area. So behind this rather nondescript building was a lot of innovation that's been going on and resulting in a lot of things that you may be familiar with, like this thing, which is a prototype of the mouse that all of us use uh, for computers. Um, it was developed there, and I think Steve Jobs one day kind of stumbled upon it from a visit to SRI, so, so the story goes, and now you know it's an integral part of our computing life. Also, Siri um, was developed at um, the SRI as well. But you know, what is the robot? And I get this question a lot from patients because they think, okay, this is some autonomous robot doing your surgery. That's not really what it is. Um, it's a master slave system, meaning that the surgeon's controlling everything that the robot is doing. Uh, unlike traditional surgery where the, where the surgeon's actually standing next to the patient, scrubbed, sterile, uh, the surgeon's actually sitting, seated comfortably a few feet away from the patient at a control console. And I'll show you pictures of that. Um, the surgery is performed through small, incisions, laparoscopic ports. And the advantage, one of the advantages is that robotic instruments have wrist-like maneuverability, allowing the surgeon to move them like his own hand. So, you know, this is a um, kind of a, what robotics looked like in 1999, was, which is really at the infancy of robotics. And what it offered was six degrees of freedom, meaning very versatile maneuverable instrumentations, uh, instrumentation that um, move almost like your own hand. Um, if you have a tremor or there's tremor going on during the case, um, the robot will filter it out to create a steady um, instrument uh, platform. There's motion scaling, meaning that you can move your hand very, very uh, widely within the console, but then the actual movement within the body is small. Uh, magnification, at this point, probably 15 to 30 times magnification, which can be really helpful from a surgical standpoint. Three-dimensional vision, high-definition vision, which is absolutely crucial 
when we're trying to see things that are small and, and where, you know, good visualization is really paramount from a surgical standpoint. Um, the surgeon console makes things more ergonomic because you're not standing at the bedside and kind of restrained and, and limited by that. And there's some better instrument selection than you would find in, in, uh, with other platforms. So when we talk about minimally invasive surgery, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about instead of making a big incision, making just small incisions. And, and at the left is what small incisions used to look, used to look like from a surgical standpoint. This is a laparoscopic technique, meaning um, small incisions, ports, and then uh, instruments, however, that are not very versatile. So it's the instrumentation would be kind of like a chopstick or a straw or a pencil. You can pull it in and out. You can rotate it, move it up and down, left and right. And that's about it. Um, robotically, what does this offer you? Well, you know, it's the same size port, but what it offers you are, as you can see, instruments that can not only go in and out, left and right and rotate, but also can um, uh, internally pitch and externally pitch in y'all like your own hand and wrist, which can make things a lot more versatile, especially when you're called upon to do much more complex surgical tasks. And as you can see, although I have real pictures, this is kind of how, when robotics is really coming about, how to how it's illustrated to, um, you know, in an academic journal where you see there is a robot, it's at the patient side, and there's an assistant at that side as well to help um, change instruments, suction, whatever needs to be done. But the surgeon himself is not sitting um, or even standing next to the patient. And he's actually at a console, which you could you know, say it's akin to a video game console where you're looking into the console where the three-dimensional picture is generated. And there are these hand controls um, that you can uh, move the instrumentation uh, around inside the body. And as you can see, these instruments do move like your own hand, which simulates um, what you would be doing with an open surgery, although at a much finer scale, because as you can see, these instruments are very, very small. You know, they're you know, the size, the tips are, are less than the, the diameter of this, um, of this dime. So we're dealing with very, very small instruments and very magnified vision, which is good in a surgical situation because you are often dealing with very, very small structures and you need high definition, high resolution to be able to see them. And the hand controls look kind of like this. Um, you know, I don't play a lot of video games now anymore. You know, when I did, they were very crude joysticks and paddles and the like. So, but this is probably what certain video game controllers look like. You have, um, you know, uh, ability to squeeze uh, with your finger and thumb or even your middle finger and then rotate and up and down and, and all that will be translated into this, which is the actual instrument um, arm, which goes through the port, which goes into the body. And everything again that you do in that console will be transmitted to the tip of this very instrument here. And you know, although we don't have a video showing you of what you're seeing, this basically this is a, a cartoon depiction, which is you know the surgeon is looking into these eyepieces, giving you three dimensional vision inside the body. These are the instru robotic instruments which are also inside the body. And with your hands, you're controlling these instruments, as you can see here, um, inside the body. So you know, there's really no autonomous function to the robot as it currently exists. It's really everything it's doing is, is being controlled by the surgeon himself. So if you want to see kind of a real life demo, what that looks like, here's, this is not me, but this is a, uh, you know, surgeon moving these instruments around inside the console. And you can see that motion is being translated directly to this, these robotic arms which are then therefore uh, then in turn moving around things inside uh, the body to do your surgical procedure. And this is the original, this is a picture of the original, what's called standard robot. Um, and it went, underwent a variety of, uh, of uh, you know, editing incarnate, uh, updates, um, much like, you know, smartphones and the like. This is the original um, system, which was, is now called the standard. And, you know, if once I show you some pictures of the newer one, you can see that it's rather crude. The arms are very, very large. <clears throat> um, some of these uh, uh, instruments are much, much bulkier than they exist now, but the concept has remained the same. You know, this is the newer version called the SI, S is in SAM, um, where the instruments are not as bulky and there's not kind of like that nylon, um, you know, sleeping bag tent covering over top. And then the XI, which is the most up-to-date um, version uh, of the robot, uh, where um, instead of having these instruments kind of free-floating in space, they've all been tethered down to a central unit, which actually helps um, 
with uh, maneuverability of the arms, which is kind of one of the problems of robotics. Um, and you know, these uh, arms do kind of rotate around the central point so that it can facilitate um, putting the, um, the actual um, robotic unit next to the patient. So I remember back in 1999 when I was a, um, as an intern and I saw this, I saw this um, video about this robotic platform that was brand new at that time. And it was being pitched by the, by the um, cardiac surgeons, the heart surgeons. And they said this was going to be used for heart surgery. Well, it didn't really work out that way. You know, what it originally was meant to, like a lot of things, a lot of innovations, what it was meant, originally meant to um, do, it didn't really fit the bill for it. And for a couple of reasons. One was that at that time around 1999 or 2000, cardiac surgery was on, the, on a downward slope because a lot of their surgeries were being replaced by non surgical means, the cardiologic stents, you know, instead of doing open heart surgery. So it never really took off from a cardiac surgery standpoint. And, I, and the story goes that, you know, the, the maker of the robot, which is Intuitive Surgical based in Sunnyvale, and mind you, this is actually a monopoly. Intuitive actually is the only currently, uh, our only current uh, robot that is FDA approved. Um, they really didn't know what to do, but then started to re make traction from a prostate cancer surgical standpoint. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about prostate cancer so the, the audience can become familiar with it. But, you know, as you can see, um, prostate cancer is a cancer that's very, very common. Um, and in men, it's the number one most common cancer. Uh, it's similar in, in scope to breast cancer in women. So we're dealing with a, with a problem that is wide ranging um, and has lots of patients. And you know, as you can see, the lifetime probability of developing cancer in men, you know, in prostate, it's about a little under 16%. It's one in seven. So that's a significant portion of men. And that was very fortunate for intuitive because, and okay, and I'll go through the anatomy of this. So, you know, what is the prostate? Well, you know, today we're going to be dealing with the kidney, which everyone knows. And the kidney is a filtering, mainly a filtering organ um, to filter blood and, and excrete waste. And, you know, as urine comes down the kidney, it goes into the bladder and then out. And in front of the in front of the bladder is the prostate. This tiny that's the bladder and this tiny gland called the prostate, which, as you can see, has a big impact when it comes to cancer and cancer incidence. What exactly does it do? Well, it only does one thing actually. It's really for, uh, serves a reproductive uh, purpose, and it's usually the size of a walnut. So, you know, as you can see, when you're dealing with a organ that's that small, and as you can see over here it's kind of way, way down here in the pelvis, it's actually pretty inaccessible. Um, and especially when you think about doing, and we'll talk about this, doing surgical, uh, approach, uh, approaching this surgically in a very deep um, area, that can be very challenging to get at, especially when it's this small. And that's kind of where the robot um, kind of serendipitously landed to help with that. But again, it's about the size of walnut, which is not all that large. And it's something that most men experience problems with because as men age, it increases in size and that makes it more and more difficult to urinate because as you can see now it's pinching off your ability to pee where this is where you would, the bladder would empty out. Um, but it can also form cancer. And this is kind of a cross section of the prostate where um, you see this uh, area of cancer forming and like cancer, what I tell my patients is, you know, the way, best way to understand cancer is cancer is like, a cell at its very, very kind of, um, uh, you know, kernel, it's a cell that doesn't die. In other words, cells in your body, they should undergo kind of a process of birth to death and they die. But when the DNA and genetic material gets de deranged, um, you know, you basically get a vampire, a zombie, right? And these, these cancer cells, they just don't know that they're, they're not supposed to continue to live and then they reproduce and and, and divide, and then you have a bunch of cells that aren't dying, and they're just kind of now uh, like a vampire zombie. Now they're kind of um, using up resources and, and invading and, and, you know, using resources for that normal body, uh, that's they're responsible for normal body um, purposes. So cancer can spread. Um, the idea is when you have cancer of the prostate, you want to remove the prostate. And as you can imagine, the urine comes through here. So then, then you need to suture everything back together like two ends of a pipe so that, you know, you reconstitute the um, uh, urinary tract so that you can still urinate. 
And, you know, like cancer, it can invade to other structures, which is when people run into trouble um, because um, then it can be hard to cure cancer when it's invaded to other structures and beyond. So, you know, robotics really found a home, you know, it didn't find a home where it was intended to, which is cardiac surgery. It did really find a home with prostate removal. And as I've, as I've pointed out, you know, prostate cancer is very, very common. And because of that, um, you know, in the robotic, uh, so the robotic uh, inventor uh, intuitive really lucked out because now you found a audience that has lots of surgery, tens of thousands of surgeries in the United States alone every single year. But interestingly enough, um, within nine, between 1999, when I first heard about this thing in some auditorium during rounds, grand rounds, to 2002, um, you know, the adoption of robotic techniques for prostate technique was was well underway and it was extremely rapid, much faster than other surgical innovations. For example, gallbladder removals, which took years, 10 years, 15 years to really achieve that level of adoption of that level of acceptance. Well, why is that? Why did that happen? Well, I think that, um, you know, there are a couple ways to do surgery. I talked about laparoscopy, you know, before laparoscopy, people would just make incisions, relatively large incisions to get cancer out, you know, organs out. And, you know, typically if we're going to do a cross technique open procedure, it would be a decision about this big. So it's not trivial. Um, around 2000, so around the time the robot was adopted, there were some French urologists who described doing a laparoscopic approach to this type of procedure, um, which people did not think was really even technically doable because um, not only is the prostate, again, a small organ, it's in a very inaccessible location deep in the pelvis, and you have to suture everything back together, which, as you can imagine, using a chopstick or a pencil could be very, very difficult in a, in a, in a confined space. So people try to do it this laparoscopic uh, way, but it really didn't work. No one could really do it. It was just too hard. But in comes the robot, and people look, saw this thing and said, well, you know what? You know what? Fine. It may not be working for the cardiac surgeons, but it may work for us. And it was described by a German group for the first time, robotic prostatectomy, RALP stands for robotic assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy in 2001. And then, and then this guy, Manny Menon, who is in uh, Michigan, and this guy, Valenciennes, who is the guy in Paris, and they described doing this robotically in 2002. And then, and again, this is a real life video of a robotic prostatectomy. So the important thing again, is that what we're doing here is suturing everything back together. You need to re you know, the, the anatomy is unimportant, but you're basically trying to reestablish, uh, you know, the, the two pipes have to be sutured back together. The two pipes have to reestablish the continuity of your urinary tract so you can pee again. And, you know, the, this is a good depiction of what the advantages are of robotics in this, in this scenario. Trying to do these types of maneuvers and put a needle in and, suture and tie and put everything back together, doing that with just simple in and out stick like chopstick instruments can be done, but it's extremely difficult, you know, difficult enough that most surgeons can do it, but, you know, give, give them something that they can actually, uh, you know, that actually has some um, ability to articulate and maneuver and well, now you can do it. Now you can do it, you know, pretty easily and, and safely and well. So, you know, that was a major factor for adoption. Um, but also, you know, what I found when I came to Stanford in 2006, so it wasn't that far much later is that, you know, I mean, sure, that's part of being living in the Bay Area is that people are nat naturally attracted to, to um, innovations and, and, and technological advances. But, you know, you sell this to a patient, it didn't take much to sell them. Like, you know, you could have an incision this big, you could have five incisions that big and patients jumped on it. And also, you know, I think that there was a good market. There were a lot of marketing factors why this became really, really popular. So, you know, we had the internet, obviously, and we have the company itself saying, you know, this is better. It leads for better precision, um, improvements and outcomes, which at that time was not actually totally proven, but but nonetheless, I mean, you know, it, it, it is attractive to hear that. And, and, you have Newsweek saying that, you know, this has revolutionized um, the process of prostatectomy and even hospitals saying, you know, if you develop complications, then you'll get your money back. So, I mean, 
this became a very um, active area for for advertising and and because of that you know the the amount of robotic units that started to proliferate you know 1999 couple just exploded and this is only to 2008 but you know then it's like okay well you know, you have an iPhone, I want an iPhone too. You have a smartphone, I want a smartphone too. I mean, how come I can't have one? You know, this is great. I mean, I should do this. It just, just took off, as you can see. And, you know, like any innovation, you know, this, uh, it, it, there's a pattern to how these things are adopted. And, you know, in, in my research, we found that there are, you know, this is not a new concept. Um, any innovation that's that's introduced to society is adopted in a predictable pattern, you know, whether that's whatever, a refrigerator, a dishwasher, you know, a computer, um, or robotic surgery. Um, the first adopters are the people who are innovators, who are the youngest willing to take risks. And then next on are early adopters who have a high degree of opinion leadership. They strive to maintain status with adoption. In other words, if you don't take it on, then you'll be left out. In other words, the patients, you know, the patients think this is great and there's a huge advertising push and, you know, they'll come and say, do you do robotic surgery? And they say, no, then they'll, they'll just walk to the guy who does. So, you know, people start to glom on and this is kind of the typical curve that occurs. You have um, a small percentage that, that are kind of the innovators who are willing to take a risk. And then as time goes on, you have the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and then finally the laggards until you have hundred percent adoption. And it follows this bell-shaped curve of, of the, um, um, I guess, even per standard deviation, but the cohorts of people that, that adopt. Well, we found the same thing. I, I published this paper back in 2013, and we found that curve basically it matches this curve, right? I mean, and by 2000, you know, 2005, essentially, no one was doing this robotically. This is the percent of um, prostatectomies done, done robotically, and this is over, over you know, each calendar year. You know, by 2009, 2010, we had almost 80% adoption. So within four years, we went from zero to 80. And, you know, from a, from a urologic cancer standpoint, you know, again, I'm doing prostate cancer, but also doing kidney cancer. Um, we found the same thing. And this is a, a, a kind of a follow-up paper, but looking at um, kidney surgeries, we're removing just the tumor and saving the kidney. And we'll talk more about that. I'll actually show you a video of that so you can, um, you can appreciate what advantage that the robot gives you, but basically the same thing is occurring with robotic partial nephrectomy, where you're removing just the tumor from a kidney cancer, or just moving just the kidney cancer and saving the kidney. And you can see what's going on here is that the robotic percentage went from 1.3% in 2004 to 64% in 2013. Sure, it wasn't as um, as rapid as the prostatectomy, but you know it, it you know basically robotic surgery eventually became the, the standard, the, the dominant um, platform um, in about eight or nine years, whereas the open procedures kind of precipitously, precipitously declined. The laparoscopic procedure um, didn't enjoy a huge amount of market share, mostly because again, like the prostatectomy, this is a very complicated, difficult procedure to do um, laparoscopically with kind of limitations of laparoscopic instrumentation. And, you know, by 2008, mid 2008, it basically had been overtaken by robotics. And similarly, um, this is a paper I published back in 2017 in JAMA, looking at the same thing with laparoscopic radical or robotic radical nephrectomy, where the entire kidney is being moved for cancer, not just part of it, which admittedly does not require that type of suturing you saw in that previous video, um, that type of dexterity, but you see the same thing is occurring. Basically, the um, the percentage uh, of robotic cases is has basically eclipsed the laparoscopic approach. So, you know, now that we're talking about kidney cancer, you know, basically what we're talking about here is, um, you know, kidney cancer. And I could show, I should have shown you back in that original um, slide of incidence of cancer. Prostate cancer obviously was the was number one for men. But kidney cancer is probably number four, number five for men and women. And, um, you know, and it can run the gamut of um, sizes. It can run, it can be like a tumor where it's very, very small and it's maybe like this big, you know, like a inch, you know, all the way to tumor that's invading or 
out of the kidney or into this is the main renal vein, the main vein blood vessel that drains the kidney. And uh, here's tumor that's inside the vein. And this is the vena cava, um, basically the main blood vessel that drains into the heart. And this type of tumor can actually go all the way up into the heart. So we're we can deal with, you know, the, it runs a gamut from very small to very large or, you know, as I mentioned, when cancer spreads, it can spread to lymph nodes, it can spread to other organs like this, the colon. And that's when you play a little bit of damage control from a cancer standpoint. The idea from a kidney cancer uh, surgical standpoint is that if you want to remove the whole kidney, there are a couple of major blood vessels. This is the renal artery, the main blood supply to the kidney, and this is the renal vein. And this cartoon here, which I'll show you a video of it, is actually a uh, endovascular stapler. It's a stapler that basically will um, take care of, uh, divide, um, or stop the blood flow to this um, artery and, and divide it. Well, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, right? A stapler. I mean, how, how, how can you use a stapler? This is, you know, uh, I think about a stapler as, as stapling pieces of paper. Well, sure. I mean, that's the idea. But what this thing will do is fire six rows of titanium staples to basically close the vessel. And then there's be a little um, blade that's activated to, to cut between those six um, uh, rows and leave three on each side so that it's well secured. And you know, otherwise, how are you going? How do you deal with this? Well, you either put some clips on there, or you tie it. You know, and and this is just as secure, if not more secure. And patients always ask me, okay, well, when you, you know, when you get the kidney free, what do you do with it? And I joke with them and say, well, we just leave it in there. No, of course not. No, we put it into a bag, and this bag can be unfurled inside the body, and then you pull it out. Um, and you know, for a kidney surgical standpoint, if you were to, you know, this is an incision maybe only about that big to get. A kidney cancer out. If you were to do this open, you'd have an incision like bigger than my screen here, as you can see, I'm, I'm reaching the limit of my screen, which can have, you know, good deal of morbidity. So I'm going to show you this video of a laparoscopic approach. So you can approach uh, kind of, um, uh, it, it, you can, it can impress upon you what kind of instrumentation we're dealing with. Cause you just, you saw that ro uh, robotic prostatectomy where you saw kind of the instruments, um, you know, moving in and out and, and uh, you know, acting almost like a miniature version of your own hand. Here, what you're dealing with is like uh, you know, basically a chopstick, right? And you're you can rotate, you can pull it in, you can pull it out, and you know, and this is all this is all fat here. And and the goal again, as you saw from a kidney cancer standpoint, kidney surgical removal standpoint, if you're going to remove the whole kidney, you got to basically stop the blood flow, and then you can move the organ, and you know. There's lots of fat. I think this patient's BMI was like 70 or, or more, which means that he was probably like, just kind of from an illustrative standpoint, let's say he was five foot six, he was probably well over 400 pounds, um, which again shows you that you can do these types of sur surgeries um, without having to, um, you know, you can still do them through a minimally invasive, minimally invasive approach, even if they're overweight. But, you know, you can see from the instrumentation that this can be fairly difficult laparoscopically and your instrumentation is a little bit more crude. And here's another video of, um, you know, a, a, another laparoscopic nephrectomy where again, you're holding things up with this hand. Um, a lot of this is one-handed. Here's another stapler, or here's the stapler in real life where it's stapled the artery. And after all said and done, now you need to free the kidney up. And this is an instrument that kind of uh, uh, stops bleeding and, and um, you know, cuts at the same time, uh, kind of like a stapler, but using just um, cautery, just using uh, electrical energy. Um, yeah, so and there, you know, the, it can be done, obviously, and it can still be done safely. And here's the kidney going to a bag. But, um, you know, the versatility, versatility of the instruments is obviously not as, as good. So... The video I'm going to show you is of, um, as we, as I touched on, of a um, partial removal of a kidney. And, you know, how do we get there? Well, you know, as I mentioned, if we're going to, uh, before we had minimally invasive techniques, you know, how you would remove part of a kidney and save the kidney would make, be make, to make this big incision over the rib. You actually sometimes take this rib out. If any of you have ever, ever broken a rib, you, you know what that feels like. That's extremely painful. And the kidney is actually located up under the rib cage. So, and it's there probably because it's, it's well um, protected, it's safe. Um, but getting there, you know, from a, 
from a surgical standpoint can be a challenge and it can be very um, disabling to the patient. Um, you know, the other challenge of kidney surgery is that you need to, um, the kidney has a lot of blood flow, a lot of blood flow. And any, at any one time, 20% of your blood flow in your body is going through a kidney. So um, you can't just cut the tumor out and just, and because if you, without stopping the blood flow temporarily to the kidney, because if you do that, then the patient will bleed to death. There's just too much blood flow. So you actually have to temporarily stop the blood to the kidney to do this type of thing. Back when we were doing these things open, uh, you know, before, you know, laparoscopic and robotic. So probably, you know, before the year 2000, um, you know, you can't just like, if you put a tourniquet on your finger, <clears throat> can't leave it there forever. And you basically can't leave the kidney clamp with no blood flow for more than 30 minutes. So to extend the time that you can do your surgery, we put ice, we used to put ice around the kidney to kind of slow down the metabolic demands of the kidney, the metabolic process of the kidney so that you actually have more time because, you know, everything's slowed down and it's not going to do as much damage uh, by the fact that, um, you know, there's no blood flow. It's like these people who fall through the ice and they still live because their body temperature is so low that the damage that could occur by not having oxygen has been, has been limited. So again, if we're gonna be doing these types of kidney surgeries, uh, we have to stop the blood flow. So this is a little clamp um, that temporarily stops the blood flow to the kidney. Because again, if we were to do this without doing this, the patient would basically bleed to death. There's just unmitigated you know, blood loss. And then you cut this tumor out and you put it back together. So in other words, you cut this tumor, here's the tumor here, you cut it out and there's a defect in this kidney and then you have to kind of repair it so that you know when you remove the clamp that it's not going to bleed. So, um, so this is a, a video of a surgery I did probably about a year ago, and, and this is a, a woman who uh, luckily did great, but she had already lost already lost her other kidney due to kidney cancer. So this is her only remaining kidney. So we didn't really have a choice but to save the kidney, and but the kidney, and as you'll see, uh, the kidney tumor, as you'll see, takes up about half of the kidney itself. So. The, you'll see down here, there's some metal clamps that stop the blood flow. This is the kidney. This whole thing is the kidney here. This is the fat overlying the kidney. And then as you can see the, you know, these scissors do have the ability to articulate, which really helps. And there's another arm in here. So instead of just having your right and left hand, you know, these robots have an additional hand that you can do use and that basically you can't see it, it's off screen, but it's basically pulling this up so I can see. And I'm basically trying to get this tumor away from this stuff, which is your normal kidney. The tumor is all over here. And the magnification is really helpful. Obviously the, the quality of the picture that you're seeing here is far better than anything we saw before with those laparoscopic um, approaches. And, um, which you can't appreciate, um, which, you know, at some point, maybe, we've, you know, once the pandemic is over, we can do like a demo, um, is that the entire um, image is three dimensional. So, you know, it's even, it, what you're seeing here is not even as good as you would be seeing in real life. Um, kidney cancer has an interesting color. It's, this stuff here is bright yellow. That's typically what kidney cancer looks like. So I'm trying to make sure that we're gonna stay away from um, the normal kidney, which is this stuff. And this different colored fat is um, actually fat on the inside of the kidney, but this bright yellow stuff, that's kidney cancer. And we need to make sure that we, um, you know, steer clear of this type of, uh, steer clear so we get all the tumor out. And, you know, the kidney is, as you can see, clamped, um, but it's not gonna be 100.0% uh, bloodless because no matter how well you clamp, there's still going to be a little bit of um, blood flow that, that goes behind those clamps. And that's fine. Um, what this would look like if those clamps weren't there would be, you know, basically gushing red blood, which, you know, if you see that, then you have to do something to stop that because the patient will literally bleed to death. Um, but, you know, given what we have here and these instruments and the robotic technique, kind of really able to kind of extricate this tumor here and I'll move it forward a little bit. 
Yeah, so let me move it back a touch here. So this tumor actually was, in, and here, here, are those, here are those clamps again. That tumor itself was coming from, it was actually growing into the main renal vein, like you saw in that cartoon. So now I have to stop. I usually don't put a clamp on the vein to stop it because, um, again, you saw there is some blood running into the kidney. So if you stop its ability to leave the kidney through that vein, then it can bleed even worse once you cut into it. But at this point, I had no choice because that you can see that rounded edge of tumor. That tumor, what we call thrombus, where it's growing into the vein, it is inside the lumen. It's inside the vein itself. So if I didn't put that clamp on there, the patient would just it would continue to bleed from that edge. Now that we've stopped the blood flow from the vein, then you know we get a much better view of what's going on here, and, and we can move it forward and continue to move the tumor. And like the kidney, we can put the tumor into, and we'd like to put it into a bag. This is a smaller bag than you would probably put in use for a, for a big tumor, but you put it in the bag. So, you know, it doesn't spill, you don't compromise, you know, it doesn't break apart, you know, you don't spill tumor inside the patient. Um, I, I wish we were done at this point, but you know, this is where the robot really helps. We have to put everything back together. So let me move this forward a little bit. So like the prostate, um, where the robotic platform really, really helps us is by the ability to easily suture. Now, again, I didn't, uh, I'm not sure I have a video anymore of, because I used to do these things uh, laparoscopically before we had, a, uh, you know, a lot of access to the robot. Um, but as you can imagine, trying to do that type of maneuver laparoscopically, as I mentioned, can be extremely tough. Um, but here, you know, basically we have an, uh, instruments that move so with such versatility that it's never really a problem. Um, but of course, uh, in a situation like this, making sure that your um, suturing is exact is really, really, um, is really important because you need to make sure that um, the, the suturing is exact because you don't want the patient to bleed afterwards. And so I put one layer down here and I put, I tie that up because I just basically put that layer of sutures where most of the blood supply had been interrupted uh, in cutting the tumor out, including that vein. So, you know, this is very easy to tie. Um, if you're trying to do this laparoscopically, if you were, if you were un, um, accustomed to doing it, it, I've seen it take 30 minutes to do just that because it's very difficult. And then we put some more sutures in here. And you have to make sure this thing is completely watertight. The other thing about the kidney is that there's urine that collects in there and the kidney is like one big filter and it's producing urine and urine collects inside the kidney and then goes down into the bladder. You want to make sure that you don't have urine coming out of this incision at the end of the day. Um, and cause that's not great either, obviously. Um, but you know, as we suture this thing together, it's, as you can see, the, it's starting to come together. Um, I actually had to take the clamps off at this point because I had exceeded 30 minutes and you don't really want to exceed 30 minutes because you know, the kidney will basically die if you do that. So, um, basically, um, took the clamps off. As so you can see, they're now lying in the, at the wayside here. Um, and then we have to, uh, oops, let me go back. We have to uh, suture everything back together, like put the kidney back on top. So here's the suturing that I'm using to put, kind of close the kidney over top of this defect. And that will not only you know stop any sort of potential bleeding from occurring, but it'll also stop um, the potentiality for that, any sort of urine to leak out from that incision. And, and these white things are little clips. So, you know, they anchor, as you can see, we're trying to cinch it all down, but it, the cinching down needs a certain amount of tension. And um, the kidney in and of itself doesn't have a lot of strength to it. So I put these clips on there and these clips stay in there, um, you know, basically permanently. And they're basically ensuring that there's enough tension on the sutures to make sure that this thing stays closed. You just don't want, you don't want it to spring open, obviously, because that could be catastrophic. Um, let's see, there's much more to see here. Eventually, you know, yeah, make, put another line of sutures here. Again, this is closing the kidney over top of that, 
what you saw before gaping defect. And then we'll put another clip on there to allow that to stay down. And as you can see, you know, there's really not that much bleeding occurring and that's what you wanna see because, you know, the, unlike other organs where you can maybe just put some pressure on it and stop bleeding, that's not the kidney. There's just too much blood flow. Okay, so, and what I tell the attendees usually with these, with these uh, talks I give is, um, I, it's great that I can give you guys some videos because um, otherwise it's just too abstract for me to explain. Um, you know, I could show you all these cartoons and stuff, but seeing the, the actual real life um, surgery is really, uh, really crystallizes for people. They really understand what's going on. So that's, I talked about the past and present. What about the future? Well, I kind of touched on this, but you know, the current situation is a monopoly. There's really only, at least in the United States, there's only one robot. There's only one robot and it's made by intuitive. Um, so there are new platforms that are on the horizon. They're not as far as I know, yet FDA approved, well, how come these weren't, you know, in development sooner? Well, there are patents. In other words, I think the patents, you know, actually the students might be more aware of the length of time the patents are in and can be enforced, I think about 17 to 19 years. So, you know, these patents were probably placed in the late 90s. So not until recently were they able to, you know, the patent were the patents released. So now that they're released, they have you have a couple, you know, players on the line. They're, uh, obviously, they don't show you much online um, for obvious reasons. Um, number one, I don't think they're necessarily ready to be released, but they also probably don't want to divulge a lot of how they're creating these platforms. This is something from Medtronic called Hugo. I don't know exactly how this is going to work, but, you know, this is another, uh, I imagine these little robotic arms will be pushed along to the side of the bed. Um, and um, there's another... Um, uh, company Johnson and Johnson and um, Ethicon initially it was actually initially with uh, Google at, at, as well, trying to make a robotic system as well. So these are definitely in in you know in the pipeline. Just a question of how long it will take to get there. Now, you know, for future directions, what are we talking about? Well, telesurgery. What does that mean? Well, you know, I think the robot was actually developed to try to potentially do surgery in a in a battlefield, for example, right? I mean. You, you can bring the surgeon to the battlefield, but you know, obviously the, you risk killing the surgeon and then you need to find another surgeon or on the space station, you know, uh, or, you know, in a place that, um, you know, I mean, obviously you can't, unless you can put the surgeon on Elon Musk, SpaceX up and down, right. I mean, it doesn't make sense to do that, to take care of someone on the space station who needs surgery or, you know, in a, in a developing country where, they don't maybe have a surgeon with the expertise, but actually have the robotic platform. Um, so, you know, I think we're getting, you know, those are things that are definitely even feasible now, which I think, you know, will become even more feasible with time. And um, video review, in other words, you know, surgeons used to operate kind of in a, in a vacuum, you know, and no one would see your surgery except for you and your assistant. Well, nowadays, I mean, with, with robot robotic techniques, these can be, basically recorded and you can, or even live time in real time, someone can be looking over your, um, your, your surgery and say, Hey, maybe you should think about doing this or stop. You know, you're going to run into trouble here. Um, AI artificial intelligence, you know, obviously artificial intelligence is something that's uh, present in um, medicine. You know, I think they're using AI now for looking at x-rays, even pathology slides. Um, obviously, doing AI to do something like this is far too complex a task, task, but I can't imagine that it will be impossible in the future. And I think that's another um, you know, future direction that robotic surgery can give us. Haptic feedback, what does that mean? Well, the, the robot as current um, does not allow you to give, does not give any haptic feedback. In other words, in, in a real life situation in surgery, if you feel something hard and you push down on it, you'll feel as hard, it won't give. Um, laparoscopically as well, because you're pushing in, if you feel something, then it'll, you'll feel resistance. A robot doesn't do that. It doesn't have, uh, the technology is not yet advanced enough to give you that type of force feedback that you're you know, running into a bone or something, um, which I imagine in the future will be um, something that will be implemented. And again, I, I mentioned there's more robotic systems on the horizon, which hopefully will translate to cheaper costs because currently 
Um, if you were to if you were to buy one of these um, robotic platforms, it would cost you somewhere around two million dollars just to buy the system. And like any large capital investment, you know that's not where it ends. Um, you know the instrumentation is not is not permanent, and the scissors and whatever graspers and stuff, and they have a certain life sp- lifespan, and, and each one of those graspers cost a couple thousand dollars. Um, just like your car, uh, you know, or your house, you know, you have homeowner's insurance, you have uh, car insurance. So, you know, there's a um, service contract so that if the thing breaks that, you know, you don't have to pay for it out of your own pocket and that can cost upwards of hundred thousand dollars a year. So hopefully with more players on online, it'll translate into cheaper cost as well for, for society. So uh, to conclude, so we have some time for questions as well. Robotic surgery has created a paradigm shift, as you can see in surgical management and and, you know, like all paradigm shifts and all newer technologies, innovations, continued improvements will continue to create hopefully additional areas to optimize patient care. Thank you so much again for the invitation and for your attention. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Chung, for that insightful presentation. I know I definitely learned a lot and I had no idea about the vast capabilities of a robot during surgery. Um, as a student taking human anatomy and physiology right now, it was also super cool to see the view of the laparoscopic procedure. Um, I see that we have a lot of questions in the chat, so we can just jump right onto the Q and A. Sure. Awesome. So first, um, Mr. Lara is asking, do you ever or see a time where the doctor and the robot do not have to be in the same hospital or even state. Right. So we, I kind of briefly touched on that. Absolutely. I mean, that was kind of one of the original goals of robotic surgery was like in a battlefield situation or even on the space station. And sure. I mean, currently as it exists, there are medical legal concerns to that. Um, uh, you know, and, but people have done feasibility things where I, I think someone was in New York or Boston and they were operating on someone in Germany. So you know, this can all be done. And that's, that's well within even, I think the scope of what can be done now. I mean, there are again, medical legal concerns about that, but I don't think there's any reason why that won't be a part of the future. Interesting. Yeah. Um, it's always cool to see um, the like future applications of these subjects. So I'm glad that someone was asking about that. Um, another question that we have that got quite a bit of upvotes was how often do the robots make mistakes? Yeah, so luckily, as I tell my patients, you know, this is not a robot that's working on some sort of Ford assembly line making a car, you know, welding pieces together. So, you know, you are controlling it. However, that being said, you know, obviously there is the risk of you know, mechanical or technical failure. Um, and that was a big concern, you know, back in the infancy of robotics. But um, I will say that, sure, have I had a situation where the robot like stopped working? Yes. How many times that happened? I think twice in 15 years. So it definitely can happen, of course, just like you get into your car and try to turn the car and it doesn't turn on or your computer or your phone. But luckily it doesn't happen that often. And, you know, occasionally there are problem situations where the robot spontaneously shuts down. Um, there are fail safes that are built in so that, you know, the instruments just don't do something completely um, crazy inside the body, but it can happen. Luckily it has not happened to me. And I've probably done, I don't know how many thousands of cases. So it's, of course it's, it's, entirely theoretically possible. I think, you know, the people who design these things have tried to make sure that they've, um, you know, tried to account for everything, but you can't account for everything. But I will say it's been very infrequent that there's been a problem. Mm, yeah, that's super interesting. And then in relation to the other question, I see that someone else is asking if a complication were to occur with the robot, like you mentioned before, does the responsibility lie with the company who created the robot or the doctor? Yeah, um, that would be a great question to ask like a like an attorney. Um, that being said, I've seen, you know, you, you hear of cases and, and the like, and, you know, you hear of sometimes a surgeon getting sued and sometimes the companies getting sued and sometimes both. Um, you know, honestly, if you were trying to, I guess, maximize your um, litigation potential, you know, you go after someone that has more money and obviously the company has a lot more money. So I don't know exactly where the, the lines are drawn with regards to that regarding uh, medical legal, um, you know, um, fault at the science and all that. But, but I have seen where, you know, situations where, you know, the company has been sued. Ah, 
Interesting. Yeah. Um, as per our final question, how does robotic surgery adoption in the urology and kidney area compare to adoption in other areas, maybe like the heart or the brain? If the adoption is high in urology, what is the specific reason for that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I kind of talked about what I know, but sure, the robot is, is actively used for gynecologic surgery like hysterectomy where, you know, uterus is removed for either, you know, cancer or um, because of, you know, benign tumors that can cause bleeding. So, you know, that's another area where um, uh, robotic surgery is really taken off. Now, for the heart, it really never has. And I, and I think there are, you know, it's multifactorial. Um, you know, I think it just, the, I think the robot works best in an area that uh, you don't have to move around the body a whole lot because, you know, you can concentrate on one area, like the kidney, like the prostate, like the uterus. Um, the heart is a beating organ. Um, I think it just makes it more challenging. I, I don't think that, you know, making small incisions makes in the cardiac surgeon's mind a big difference. Now in the brain, um, again, you're putting these small incisions in, and then to, I should have said this, to get, to gain access to the space, you need to, uh, kind of uh, ins insufflate or inflate the belly with uh, gas, usually carbon dioxide. So it doesn't have, it's not flammable and, it, and it's easy to get and it's physiologic. But for the brain, I mean, basically you're, you're confined by the skull. Um, you can't really make space at all. So, you know, for something like that, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, you, you know, you don't have a potential space that you can, you can expand so you can see, you just kind of have to take the, the skull off and then do your surgery or do it, you know, inside blood vessels and the like, and, and deploy coils if there's like a, like an aneurysm or a clot or something. So there are definitely areas where this could be, the use could be expanded. Um, you know, there are obviously areas that it's not really going to be all that feasible like the brain. Um, but, you know, I think again, as, um, as innovations continue to occur, then, um, you know, the, the indications will continue to expand. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm also super interested to see the future of robotic technology and especially for robotic surgery. Yeah. Um, with that, thank you guys so much for all of your questions. Um, a big thank you once again to Dr. Chung for his amazing keynote presentation as well. And thank you everyone for attending our second keynote of the symposium. As you head off to the numerous sessions we have for today, we wanted to tell you about a couple of things that will make your experience as great as possible. First, if you're planning on attending sessions like the poster presentations or the student exhibitor sessions that have breakout rooms, using your phone may lead to some issues. Second, we recommend that you download the latest version of Zoom to avoid breakout room problems. Third, we really encourage you to interact with our student speakers by asking questions, turning on your camera, you know, speaking directly to the students as we're trying to replicate a live symposium setting. And finally, we have an important program note at 11 to 11.20 um, in student talks breakout room or breakout session two, um, Saswath Ramachandran will be speaking. Um, please be sure to visit the webpage and stay up to date with the schedule. Thank you again, everyone. And this concludes our webinar.